modern day Rosa Parks. You're a modern day Rosa Parks. Where's the other Lisa? Oh, you're a modern day Rosa Parks. Um, raise your hand if your name's Lisa. There's gotta be at least 20 of you in here. So, yeah, okay, good. The guy in the back, your name's not Lisa. Put your hand down. Okay. <laughs> All right, so way to go, Fred. All right, so forgot, I thought I forgot. Huh? So anyway, uh, I hope you're gonna have a little fun, but what we're really gonna do is you're gonna learn an awful lot. And it, it's really a humbling position to be here. I promise you, uh, I, I've never taken this for granted. My kids, my kids still can't believe it, that people come to hear their dorky dad uh, give some presentation. And uh, you know, sometimes I am dorky, I'm proud of it. Uh, I'm still just a regular guy uh, a lot of times. But I'm glad you're here, and I want to make sure that you get your money's worth, and that you leave here with some hope, because there is hope. And as soon as uh, somebody tells me there's no hope, I said, no, you, you got to sit down and listen to this. Because how many sheriffs have you seen from across the country since March of last year that have started to stand for freedom? And even in California and New York, they told their governor, we will not comply with what you're saying. We will not do it. And when I give you the presentation, I'll show you a big old long list. And this is just maybe just a fraction of the sheriffs that have done something. But I show a bunch of sheriffs that have stood for this, and then I ask the question, were they wrong? Was Sheriff Rogers in Elkhart County, Indiana, about nine, ten years ago, wrong when he protected and defended and erected the barriers against the FDA to leave the Amish farmer alone in his community that they kept harassing? Was Sheriff Rogers wrong when he told him if you come back in this county without duly signed warrants and probable cause and a reason to go on this man's property without his permission, I will arrest you for trespassing. Sheriff Rogers did that. And, and this year, he, he turned out as sheriff, there's strict term limits, which, except for good constitutional sheriffs, I don't support term limits. One to stay there forever. But no, I, I, that's okay. They have term limits. You can only stay in two terms. So he left, and his undersheriff that became the sheriff hired him to be the jail commander. And then this past year, he ran for county commissioner and he beat a 16-year incumbent. And then he won the, and then he won by 69%. People are grateful to have a constitutional county commissioner now. And he's going to be speaking at, with me at our CSPOA convention near Houston on February 26 and 27. And if you have any sheriff that ever needs to get educated about this stuff, you better try to get him to that convention. And you can get that information from me. My card's still back on the table. The few books I had left from last night from uh, Larvita's thing, are, well, they're all gone now. So you can get on our website, and I ask each of you uh, to get one of our pamphlets and sign up to be a member of the CSPOA. I'm not gonna force you, <laughs> but if you wanna keep us going, I ask you to become a member or make a donation. And I ask that you do what you can to keep us going and keep us moving. In the last three weeks, I've been in Kentucky twice, Washington State, and then Reno, and then yesterday in Lynn, and today here, and I start the whole process again next week. Um, I know I have two or three in Nevada and California coming up, and I'm gonna keep doing it uh, as long as I have resources to do it. And what you will see tonight is the truth. Some of it might surprise you, because I'm gonna be showing you something in this little powerful book. And I'm gonna be showing it up there because I still have a few of these back there. And I'd really like this crowd, I think, you know, you guys probably have the money. Uh, Fred, how much did you bring? How much money did you bring? <laughs> you brought zero? Okay, I'll take half of that. And, and then it, this, this lawsuit that I filed against the federal government cost $400,000. So if you could raise about half of that tonight to reimburse me for that, that'd be great. This is all, I'm not greedy. I didn't ask for the whole thing. So what I would ask is that everybody do their part in this holy cause of liberty.
And I'll tell you what, even the founding father said, we can't do this without some funding. And how many times did George Washington get mad at the other founders for not helping with finances in the, the war? And man, when they were at Valley Forge right before they marched into Trenton, he was really upset that they didn't have anything to eat except fire cakes. Anybody know what fire cake is? I bet, I bet you do. Huh? It's just water and flour, you know, or water and a little bit of cornmeal, and they taste awful. But most of the time, they were just mixing that. It's kind of like a mush, cold water and flour and eating it. Now you know why they were dying of dysentery? Yeah, it, it, they were not healthy. And, and anyway, I'm going to end the, I'm going to end my presentation with what really happened at the Battle of Trenton. Amazing leadership because of George Washington. Okay, and so uh, one thing I want to start this whole thing with is look what's happened to America in just the last 10 months. Did you ever think you'd see this? I never thought I'd see this. I always knew some, I mean, they were always doing crazy things, but it was usually gradually, you know, but now they've just thrown the whole thing out. Destroyed our Constitution, destroyed individual liberty, destroyed natural law, as he mentioned in his prayer, destroyed the will of the people and our trust in government. And let me make sure that this is very clear to everybody here and let this go across the entire state. There is no public official anywhere in this state or anywhere in this country that has the authority to do any of that. And then for them to come to us and say, Yes, we're going to have to destroy your business, and we're going to have to destroy your freedom, and we're going to have to destroy your religions, and we're going to make you subjects to us and to our whims and capricious laws or decrees. They're not laws. I'm not going to say no. To our capricious executive orders. And it's all for your own good, so it's okay. And we're a lot smarter than you because you don't know how to, to take care of yourselves and you don't know what to do to avoid getting diseases and viruses. And even though the mortality rate of this COVID-19 is not even 1%, we're gonna shut everything down and arrest you if you don't wear a mask and arrest you if you open your business. And if you think that we're gonna let you open your own business the way you want, We'll arrest you for that too. And that you have no recourse and there's nothing you can do about that because it's a, an emergency and we get to do whatever we want when there's an emergency. Let me tell you, in your state constitution or the federal constitution, there is no exemption for liberty or for your civil rights. And anyone comes to you and say, do this, I'm, I'm taking your freedom away from you, but I'll give it back to you as soon as the emergency is over. If they can do that, there will always be an emergency. They can do whatever they want if they're allowed to do that. And the Constitution comes into play even more when there's an emergency, not less. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had one leader in this country, kind of like Governor Nome, yes. who would say, yeah, who would say, we really want to help you with this. We really want to keep you safe, and we really want to get rid of this disease, but we are not going to destroy America to do it. And if you'll unite with me, and we work on this together, we'll find a solution. But we're not going to destroy America and then think, oh, thank goodness we did that. And any of the things that they've done, has it worked? It hasn't. And so then they, what did they say? It's like global warming, and they say, oh, no, it's not global warming, it's climate change. Well, it was the same thing with this. It wasn't, it wasn't to get rid of it, it was just to flatten the curve a little. And as long as we did that, then we could still force you into slavery and complete servitude to government. You are subjects of ours, is what they're trying to tell you. And that's what that mask is. Yeah. It's the new slavery. Yep. You yep. do what we say to the extent that we have to wear something that they say on our faces? <laughs> kind of like the Jews in Germany taking the number. You know? And so don't get on the train and don't even line up for the train. And I'm so 
I so admire those who have refused to do that. And thank you so much for having me. And let's let's see where we're going and, and let's see what the presentation. I've, I've got some video clips on there and, and uh, I believe everything's working. Let's see, make sure that it's not too loud. But this first clip I'm gonna show you is all we're at, all we're after at the CSPOA Constitutional Sheriff's. That's all we're after is what this video you're gonna see right now, okay? The YouTube video going viral, posted on the internet by two activists who brought a camera into the Albany International Airport while they passed out flyers. Now, it led to a heated dispute over First Amendment rights. Beth Wharton has our top story. Beth? Hi, Vanilla. Well, as you'll see in the video clip, an airport spokesman tries to stop these activists from their mission, but a sheriff's deputy steps in to settle the confrontation and the right to free speech. And so, hey everyone, this is Sasha Jessica. I'm here at Albany International Airport. The young woman is standing outside the security checkpoint at the airport, telling the camera that she's there to hand out flyers to travelers, reminding them of their right to opt out of getting the body scan, which she claims carries health risks. Okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. First of all, turn this off right away. Airport spokesman Doug Myers tells the crew to stop videotaping and to go downstairs which they agreed to do, and they are confronted again. Sir, so you have a million dollars insurance policy here. You're violating the airport authority no, no. guidelines. No. You know, okay. That doesn't matter to us at all, okay? So you check that out. No, you're in our airport. But as the tension builds, Sheriff's Deputy Stan Lennox steps in, separating the two parties, then lays down the law. Obviously, this is your constitutional right, okay? As far as we're concerned, you're not breaking any law. What? Who is he? He's not a judge. He's not a lawyer. Don't deputies and sheriffs have to ask lawyers before they do anything? A deputy assigned to the airport security says this is your constitutional right? Exactly what every person in law enforcement should be doing. What would we normally hear in something like this? He goes in and he starts macing them and he says you're under arrest for trespassing and you didn't obey these rules and you did oh my goodness. And he's actually not finished. But he's defending, he's erecting the barriers and he's doing what he promised to do when he took his oath of office. Uphold, defend, protect and preserve the United States Constitution. We want you to know this is your constitutional right. They already knew it. The question is, do our law enforcement officers know when that's supposed to be happening? They swore an oath to do it, and this guy kept it. Okay, that's that's what we want to get across to you guys. Myers objects, ordering airport employees to allow only ticketed passengers upstairs, accusing the activists of blocking the escalator. But once again, Deputy Lennox defends their First Amendment rights. Sure, we don't want to do that. I told you why. I'm Jason Burr. Let me see your identification. I don't need to show you my identity. He doesn't have to show you his identity. <laughs> he doesn't have to show you anything, guys. <laughs> Man, don't you love it when it happens and they get it right? I just want to ask every sheriff in this state, in this country, are you getting it right? Are you keeping your oath? Are you defending God-given rights that we were blessed with in America? Are you following the dictates of some supposedly well-intentioned governor or mayor or whatever, it doesn't matter, because they have no authority. And see, I don't want to get into uh, weighing the burdens or benefits or the success of any mandate from a governor. I don't get into the weighing that, uh, the, the efficacy of wearing a mask. I get into, do you have the authority to tell me and force me to wear a mask? or to force me to shut down, or to stay home, or to grovel before you and kiss your ring, or something else that I won't do. <laughs> the question is, the authority, what is granted by our Constitution and by the laws of nature and nature's God? And are you keeping your word when you took your job, you swore an oath to God for all of us? In God's name, you promised us to defend our rights to, to be here and to have business and pursuit of happiness and to have liberty. And now you're telling me that in case of emergency, 
you don't have to keep your word and you don't have to keep your oath. That's a lie. You always have to keep it. Now this is exactly the opposite of what we're after. Now to a News 10 exclusive. A Stockton man wants an apology tonight for a wake-up call he should have never received. It is a story you'll only see on News 10. Lee Painter tells us why police and federal agents knocked down his door. This is what they did to my door. At 6 this morning, a SWAT team surprised Kenneth Wright at his front door. In my underwear. In my underwear. Before I get to the door, I hear him say, hit it. And I get ready to hit the door, and they hit the door. They almost hit me. So I said, hold on. They hit it again. I said, hold on. But the SWAT team busted in, taking Wright. They come grab me by my neck and drag me out my house. So right there in the grass. Thrown to the ground and handcuffed, the law enforcement then searched his house. And they put me in the backseat of a police car for over six hours. From six o'clock to 12.30, they had me handcuffed in the back of a police car with nothing on but my ripped up underwear that they ripped in the yard. Right, said they also <laughs> raised three children holding up for two hours. But they failed to find their quarry, Bright's estranged wife. Wright later complained to Stockton's mayor and police, but the city pointed to the U.S. Department of Education. They said you. Did you catch that? Yeah. A SWAT team from the Department of Education. <laughs> and I hate to tell you this, but this was actually several years ago, seven or eight actually, the Obama administration. And uh, you would think that they would be stopping that sort of thing. So we got a hold of this. This guy's name is Kevin Wright. I haven't ever talked to him. I'd love to. We'd love to name him Citizen of the Year or something at the CSPOA. But we checked into it because then the Solicitor General came out and said, we don't serve warrants for failure to pay student loans. That's what this was about. And his estranged wife was the one that owned it. She didn't even live there anymore. So they take him out to the car for six hours in his torn up underwear. And of course, traumatized the children. And so we started looking into this, and Houston, Texas had 1,500 such warrants for failure to pay your student loans. Now they're giving them back to you. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> we take you to jail and send SWAT teams to your house and then let you, no, nah, never mind. Yeah. So this is how ridiculous it is, and this is the mentality that we see happening with the COVID-19 enforcement strategies. Somebody says, go, we go. Oh, Stockton police. Oh, yeah, we'll help you federal agents. Sure, why not? You want us to go? We don't know what it's about. We'll just go and kick in the door for you. A no-knock warrant for failure to pay a stupid student loan. And so what do we know about government? It gets stupid an awful lot. And we got to have somebody. Is there somebody in the state of Minnesota, anywhere in government, sheriffs or county commissioners or county attorneys or state reps or, well, can't ask about the governor <laughs> or somebody in the state somewhere that has the intelligence and the sensitivity to know when we've gone too far like, that we might be going for attorney general Bob Wardlow for attorney general 2022 okay, thank okay. You. <laughs> but seriously <clears throat> if we I hope we get these elected I hope anybody to take the the place of these Self-appointed dictators. Dictators in America? And a sheriff in Florida arrested a pastor for having church. You want to know his name? Pastor Rodney Howard Brown. Taken to jail, posted $500 bail, and went back to church. And then guess what happened? The charges were dropped. And I'll bet you that any of these ridiculous charges that are going against some of you for just keeping your business open, that you could prove that the pittance being offered to you by the federal government, $2,000 every seven or eight months is probably not going to be enough to keep your family alive and fed. And so that you prove that you're doing this because it's your right and that you want to feed your family and your employees kind of need to do the same thing. So far, the judges have been siding with the people. Not every time, but most of the time. And the governors don't care. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, sorry. Okay, this, I love this. 
Maybe somebody can tell me. Who said this? There are two types of laws. Just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And we certainly in law enforcement have no moral responsibility to enforce unjust laws. How could we ever think that it's okay to enforce tyranny? Laws of hate and prejudice and stupidity have no place in America. We got rid of those, I thought. And yet, they do it with impunity and with such arrogance. I'm taking care of you. You want to take care of me? Secure my rights, secure my liberty, and let me take care of myself and my family. Okay? Right. So, who said this? And don't say me. I come close, but I actually looked it up. Who said it? No. Jefferson. Who said that what? Jefferson. Okay. You're saying MLK? Who said MLK? <laughs> Did you say it? You, you should have thrown a quarter at me or something and I would give me the, the dollar for saying it. Right. Don't be afraid to speak up. Yeah. That's Martin Luther King. Love what he said here. Absolutely. And show that to the left. Civil disobedience? Absolutely. Every one of us. Do not forget that our solution is effective and peaceful. No violence, folks. None. In fact, I need to go on the record again here. Because I told none of our people to go to Washington on, on uh, January 6th. I said, no, I don't feel good about it. I was asked to go. 17 times. Browbeat that I wasn't going to go. I said, I'm not going. It doesn't look like a good situation. And there's going to be too many emotional people there. I didn't think they were going to go do what they did. And anybody who thinks Trump wanted them to go right inside the U.S. Capitol has got to be a crazy Democrat or somebody else that doesn't <laughs> care about the truth. He, yeah, no. <laughs> he didn't want that to happen. What, how's that going to help him in any way? No. He did not want that to happen. Let's be truthful here. And so on the 20th, now there were, oh, let's have more protests and let's have more rallies. And the FBI lied and came out and said there's going to be, they're planning armed protests in every state capital of the entire union. I knew when he said it, he was lying. It was a lie. And if it, for no other reason, I knew there would not be an armed protest in Honolulu. I've been to Honolulu a bunch of times. They don't have armed protests there. You can't get, yeah, you can't get them off the beaches and you can't get a gun. You know? so, no, it wasn't going to happen. There's no way. And so I announced again, don't go to any protest at all. Stay home. Make it look empty. And when it was empty, did they go, oh, I guess we were wrong. No, they don't care. They keep lying. They're going to keep lying. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. But, friends, I'm, I don't have anything against Donald Trump. Let's be honest about this. Did you see Senator Rand Paul on with George Stephanopoulos? I just happened to see it on the Internet. That's where I get most of my news. And, and Ron Rand missed the point. A little bit because George kept saying Attorney General Barr and so-and-so else investigator and the government this guy and the government that they said there was no evidence of fraud in the vote on November 3rd and then Senator Paul should have simply said could you please show me their investigations that prove that show me the investigation from Attorney General Barr he made that statement right after Trump came out with it, and they had no time. You think that they would have done an investigation in a matter of six or seven days? Washington, D.C. doesn't know how to do a quick investigation. 
They did no investigation, and yet Barr is announcing there was no evidence of vote fraud. None of us know that there, there was or what the, that there wasn't. Why? Because nobody investigated it. All of these claims, and there was affidavits of, of wrongdoing all over the place, but there was still no investigation. Wouldn't it be prudent to investigate all computerized voting tallies? How easily did they hack into the Pentagon computers? How easily have we hacked into computers nationwide? Worldwide, for that matter. And what is the government, what is the government purpose in having computerized voting? How does that serve you? How does that serve the American people that we do votes on computers? It does not, it does not serve us. I did an interview a month ago, three and a half weeks ago, with some newspaper out of Frankfurt, Germany about all of this stuff. And it came out and then I couldn't read it, obviously, but I found somebody who could translate for me. And it was not a bad article, but I told him, I said, why are people already drawing the conclusions, especially the Democrats and anybody leaning left, that there was no vote fraud? You don't know that and neither do I. It's astonishing that we couldn't do at least a few investigations on all of that. But I said, I've been fighting for 25 years. And you know who opposed it at first? The Republicans. They didn't want to hand count all precincts in the entire country or not. we were actually fighting it in Arizona in our state. They said, no. I said, just hand count. 1% of the vote to see if it coincides with the computer, uh, the computer tallies. That's all. No, no, we're not going to do that. Take too much time in. So what is, why are we leaning on computers so heavily and trusting those? Because it makes it quicker. That just helps the media. Your buddies in the media, that's all it helps. And so the two things that, Ron, that Rand should have said is we want all computers checked every time there's an election or don't use the computers and go back. You know what Germany said? They have paper ballots. And I would like to see it to where your name is on your ballot. And if there's something ever wrong, they can come back to you and say, did you vote? Did, is this your ballot? Is that how you voted? Yeah. It could always be proved. But they don't want to do any of that. Why? <laughs> because they want to keep the cheating going. Or they have something to hide. They don't want it. They have something to hide. All right, let's get back to this. I totally support that. And the main point there is, if we don't obey unjust laws, we don't enforce them either, sheriff or governor. This is your oath. It's not word for word this way in every state, but this is similar to almost every state. Very similar. And every time, the U.S. Constitution is first. And then the Constitution in the state where you work. And it's there. Sometimes, and now this has been recent changes, especially the one in Florida, it'll say, and also uphold and obey the laws of the state. But that's usually last. The Constitution is first, the state Constitution second, and so on. And a lot of the oaths, especially the military, say this and protect it from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. Who's a domestic enemy? Anyone opposing our Constitution. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's true. Okay. Now, we got to turn to Hollywood to get the definition and the purpose of the oath of office. You took an oath. If you recall, when you first came to work for me, and I don't mean to the National Security Advisor of the United States, I mean to his boss. And I don't mean to pass it with him. You 
dedicated word to his boss. You gave your word to the people of the United States. Your word is who you are. We went to Hollywood to get it right a week ago. Just so you're wondering, that's clear in present day. So here's Article 6, and this is where the Founding Fathers put it in the Constitution and required every public official to swear an oath of allegiance to the Constitution. It is not sworn to the governor or to the president or to any other public official. It's sworn to us in God's name that they will, the senators and representatives, the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, that takes care of all three branches, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. Why did they put that in there? Article 6. There's only seven articles in the Constitution. Article 6 talks about the supremacy clause and the oath. And the oath is something every one of us have to take by law, by the supreme law of the land. If you don't keep your oath, what crime have you committed? Some people say treason. Obvious, it's obviously perjury. This is a sworn oath, and that should be a criminal investigation. How do you know somebody does well, okay, somebody passes a gun control law, which is coming down very soon. If your sheriff's going to enforce this, you think he's going to stand against Biden's door-to-door -door confiscation of AR-15s, AK-47s? Any other assault rifle? You see what we're preparing here? That was the same thing with the Brady Bill. Let's see how many sheriffs go along, because we know we can get them to do anything after that if they do something this stupid, when we threaten to arrest them if they don't comply with a federal mandate that they had no business doing in the first place. And then they're out of 3,080 sheriffs in the country, Seven fought it. Seven. Even more crazy, only one from Texas. There's 254 sheriffs there, and only one did it from the state sovereignty independent state. Let's keep going. State nullification. This is something that Jefferson and Madison wrote a lot about, and it was in pursuance of the uh, Alien and Sedition Act. Alien and Sedition Act. Who, which, and who supported that? Which founding father and president supported the Alien Sedition Act? John Adams. John Adams. Exactly what we fought an a war of independence to stop. And John Adams got sick and tired of people badmouthing him all the time, and he totally supported this thing. He even had people arrested and paid fines, and Jefferson became president, and he pardoned every one of them and gave their money back. And he and, Jeff he and Madison said this stuff that states have the authority to judge the constitutionality of the federal government's laws and decrees. And they didn't make a law. He said, you don't have to make another law about this. All we have to do is enforce the Constitution. And the states have the authority to do it. Why? Because the states formed the new federal government. They are the boss. And who's the boss of the states? We the people. Man, we need to read the Tenth Amendment a little bit, don't we? Now, just so you know, and maybe we need to explain this just real briefly. Why did I sue the federal government? Why on earth, we were talking about this earlier, why on earth would a small town sheriff from southeast Arizona take on the Goliath federal government Clinton administration? Your responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what I swore to do. I said I would protect from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And so anyway, the Brady Bill was what I sued over. Now, what was so big and bad about the Brady Bill? Well, just everything. But especially that they're trying to commandeer the office of sheriff for federal bidding. This is what they did. Congress passes this that Sarah Brady was trying to get going for 10 years. Bill Clinton was pushing it the whole time. He finally got it in. He signed it into law saying that the sheriffs must enforce the gun control provisions associated with the Brady Bill. 
Were we ever asked? Were we ever negotiated with? Did we have a contract? No. Does your sheriff work for the federal government? I guess he can if he wants to, but that's not his job. He's not supposed to, but he could probably do it for free if he, if he wanted to. Should he? Who does he work for? You. Who pays his salary? You do. So the federal government can't hire me. They can't fire me. Yet now I'm supposed to work for them for free without any negotiation. And they said, if you don't, we will arrest you. $10,000 fine or a year in jail. And I'm not making any of that up. You can look up the whole Brady Bill on the, on the uh, internet and look at the whole thing. It'll take you a long time. Or you can get one of these little, where'd I put it? Right here. Oh, yeah. Perfect, yeah. thank you. So this has the highlights of that case. It is the most powerful 10th Amendment decision ever, and it's the only time in American history where sheriffs sued the federal government. And then, adding the icing to the cake, we won. We won. Sheriff Prince and I were standing in the Supreme Court together. Well, we were actually sitting, but just a few rows from me was James Brady, for whom the Brady Bill was named. I went over and shook his hand. He shook my hand back. He said, Sheriff, I really admire you for what you've done. I said, don't tell your wife that. <laughs> and we had a nice talk. But we won. And then, <laughs> thank you very much. Got a cheerleader. And so, do you want to know some things that it said in there? You need to know this. Your sheriff needs to know this. We have held, however, that this, we have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. Don't you wish your state legislature knew that? And then, get this one. I can't reiterate this one enough, but the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. Does that mean anything to you now? About all these COVID ridiculous mandates? The Constitution protects you from those supposed good intentions. There's no such thing as a good intention that gets to violate the Constitution, in other words. And then they go on and said, it, the Constitution, divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely so that we may resist the temptation to concentrate power. Resist the temptation, folks, to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to, you ready? The crisis of the day. The crisis of the day. So does the crisis of the day disqualify the Constitution and your civil rights and your God-given rights? It does not, Sheriff. It does not, Counselor for the Sheriff's Association, or any other attorney that wants to advise the sheriffs that they just have to go along, that they have to follow orders, just like they said at the Nuremberg trials after World War II against Nazi murderers and genocidal maniacs. Folks, we lose freedom because of a crisis of the day? No way. No way. The states have the authority to judge the constitutionality of the federal government. And I'll get this. He goes further. He also argued, Jefferson, states should refuse to enforce laws which they deemed unconstitutional. What is this heresy? Only the U.S. Supreme Court can decide what's constitutional. Well, they did hear how many of your sheriffs are enforcing this. They said, well, we, we have to do what the Supreme Court says. Okay, here you go. Go do it. This applies to your job specifically. How many of them have ever heard about the case or have ever read anything about it? Mm, maybe 1%, maybe 2 No, we've got a lot to do, folks. And I'm ready to do it, and I'm not going to quit. You know why? He's like, I got five kids and I've got 15 grandkids and it's for each other. I know. I told my wife to quit having all their damn kids and she just kept having them. <laughs> so, anyway. 
I knew it. Siding with her. You know? So, folks, this really is such a tremendous cusp we're on. Are we going to be the generation to decide to go ahead and let government destroy our nation no. and our Constitution, or are we going to do something about it? And you've got to get a relationship with your sheriff, and he's got to hear from you. And I don't care which sheriff it is. They've got to hear this. They've got to see about this case, and they've got to understand their oath. Simple, simple solution. You took an oath. You, that presupposes that you're going to know and understand the Constitution because that's what you swore an oath of allegiance to, and then you enforce it. It's just that simple. Let's keep seeing how simple this is. The word, the key word there, interpose. States are duty bound to interpose its power to prevent the federal government from victimizing its people. Could you say the same thing about your government? The counties and the sheriffs are duty bound to interpose on behalf of the people to make sure they are not victimized by their own government. Wow. What a novel idea. Why would we not do that? Could you imagine a sheriff said, no, I can't do that. And the reason? I uh, have to obey orders from the governor. I don't want to get arrested for uh, not obeying the War Powers Act or the Powers Emergency Powers Act or all this other nonsense. Like any of that could suspend liberty. So it's like playing defense in basketball. The guy who's the ball is there, then I'm here. And where do I not let him go? I don't let him get to the law-abiding citizen, which is the who. I stay in the way. I'm not using my gun. Don't even need a gun. He moves, I move. He tries to get the law-abiding citizen. He tries to get one of you leases. <laughs> not going to happen. tonight except the guys. Okay? You're either leases or friends. Okay. okay, so you interpose. All right, these are the two sheriffs that were involved in this case. Jay Prince from Montana, yours truly from Arizona. And this is again, we have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject. Look at it. It's in that little book. Why do I keep walking over this thing? I'm going to keep it with you. Okay? It's in there. Okay? A lot of you who bought anything off the table, you get that for free. If you want to buy some more, I don't know, there are a few left. But anyway, a 400,000 page document, and you got, most of you got it free tonight. Are you kidding? There are three for five. You should be getting these by the dozens, by the caseloads, and passing these out to everybody who ever says, oh, you guys know what you're talking about. You have no evidence. You have no proof. Okay. Read that. This is the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, you never heard about it? Well, ignorance of the law is no excuse. It's not a law. Actually, you know why this one is? Scalia doesn't make up new law. He just reinforces the old one. He's just reinforcing the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. He gave us a history lesson. Do you know what he does in here? He actually quotes the uh -huh. Federalist Papers. Oh, my goodness. My gosh, we'll get into that. I'll show you a couple of them. Look, Judge Rawls, who heard my case at the district court in Tucson, said that. Mac is just forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the act. He doesn't call it a law. He calls it the act. Because it's not a law. It's pretend legislation. And that term is in the Declaration of Independence. 
subjected himself to possible sanctions. What were the sanctions? You're in jail or $10,000 fine or both. And I'll show you that in a minute. And then the Cleo. Who knows what a Cleo is? Okay, what's a Leo? Who knew that? Well, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> so the chief law enforcement officer, this is one time. How do you know that the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer? If you want, they always say, where do you see that? Where's that in the Constitution? Well, it's not. Why would the Constitution say who the chief law enforcement officer is in the county? It's for the federal government, mostly. There's a few things about, that require the states like to have a gold and silver standard and to guarantee a Republican form of government. And why can the founding fathers say that in the Constitution? Because it was the states doing it. So they made a few rules that even the states could not violate in the Constitution. Huh. Amazing, huh? So, we have to still go by this. <laughs> I love it. So, the Cleo is mentioned in the Brady Bill, and they call the sheriffs that did the lawsuit the Cleos. And who did the BATF bring the, the 25 page order for all of us to follow these orders to every sheriff in the nation? Because they know who the Cleo is. Don't you love it when the federal government gets something right? Yeah. So, a lot of your sheriffs, do they know they're the Cleo? No, nope, that's where you come in. And this is the threat of arrest. Right out of the Brady Bill, under separate provision of the GCA. What's that? Gun Control Act, the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. Any person who knowingly violates the section of the GCA amended by the Brady Act shall be fined under this title in prison for no more than one year or both. I didn't make it up, did I? Okay. And then this one was just really quickly just says we object to being forced into federal service and we think it's unconstitutional. And then look at Ronald Reagan. He comes out and says, we should have a rebellion. Look at it. It reeks with injustice and is fundamentally and has earned a rebellion. And yet he's calling for rebellion against the tax system of America. And why? And I've got to ask, who's going to protect you from the crimes committed against you by the IRS? Mm -hmm. You know your sheriffs can stop that too? Because one thing we know is Reagan didn't do anything about this. And I thought, I thought he's still a pretty decent president, but we haven't, we just did, haven't been able to drain that swamp, have we? And the IRS is top of the list. Federal Reserve being right next to him. And how are we going to stop this? Because you know it's not going to happen in Washington, D.C. How? County by county, sheriff by sheriff, one county at a time, till we get them off the backs of the American people. And every time I say this, people come up and say, hey, you know you're going to get audited now. Well, knock on wood, where's the wood? <laughs> knock on wood, it's never happened, but it did happen to my father, and ha, he ended up getting them. Okay. Now this, ooh, I like this. This is Thomas Paine. Remember, Thomas Paine was the guy who wrote The Common Sense and the American Crisis, and Washington at Valley Forge, right before they went into Trenton, had all his men read the American crisis to motivate them to go back across the Delaware with him to fight who? The Hessians, who were trained killers and mercenaries from Germany hired by the British to come kill Americans. Trenton was big. So he calls in Thomas Paine, and look what Thomas Paine said. Britain, with an army to enforce her tyranny, is that what we have police doing today? This sounds like it. You want to ask anybody in your state, any attorney that's trying to advise sheriffs not to stand for the Constitution? Could you imagine somebody doing that? Well, you have it here. Yep. Are we the army to enforce tyranny? Or are we going to be the Cleos to stand for liberty? Which one do you want your sheriff to be? written with her army to force tyranny, has declared that she has a right 
not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. And that was the declaratory act. That they said they could do anything to us. And then what does Thomas Paine do? And I think I used the wrong um, punctuation here. I think he was asking a question, but I put a period. And being, if being bound in that manner, in other words, that government can do anything to us. We already discussed that. If they can force us and arrest us for not wearing a mask, if they can force us and arrest us for opening our business, if they can force us and arrest us not to go to church, then they can do anything to us. And they can go to your sheriff and say, if you don't do this, we're going to arrest you. And then doesn't that all encompass everything he says here? And if being bound in that manner is not slavery, then is there a thing of slavery on earth? And that's so obvious. And look how we've come full circle. Because is there anyone in Washington, D.C., both Democrat and Republican, who believe they have any limitations and that they can't do anything they want? They all believe it. And now that has been a virus that your state legislatures have been infected with and your governors have been infected with. And we've got to have these Cleos turn it around or we're lost and America's dead. And I will never accept that. Especially when I know that most of the time the sheriff can defend you by a simple phone call. Hey, health department, I don't want you to come in here and bother Lisa again. Do you understand? Hey, governor, do not bring your goons into my, my county again. Lisa's just trying to do what she feels is right, and she's hurt no one. And it's her right to do this. And Jennifer Long testified, she was an IRS agent, and she testified about all the crimes the IRS committed in 1998 before Congress. And she stayed with the IRS, which we couldn't believe. But others testified and refused to give their identity because they were so afraid of IRS retaliation because they knew how ruthless and cruel and criminal they were. And she calls them criminal. And most sometimes illegally. No kidding. That's a big surprise to all of us, huh? <laughs> Who's going to stop it? Nobody in Washington, D.C. ever has, and even though she testified before Congress. And here's another one. And, and what I'm showing here is why we distrust government. And this is just another reason. 2015, fr front page of USA Today. This isn't one of those crazy periodicals that we get in, the, in emails or in the post office. They're not so crazy. U.S. drug agents engaged in sex parties. I'm sorry for some of you kind of young here. This gets a little bit, you know, sorry. Cartel supplied the prostitutes. Justice review fine. And this was happening for years. Drug enforcement administrative offices, off agents, are having sex parties in Colombia against the cartels that we're supposed to be fighting. You know what's really significant about this story? Dozens and dozens of agents were committing this crime and not a one of them was ever investigated, arrested, or reprimanded or fired. No one. And we're supposed to trust all this. And these are the people that you would turn over your, you know, your health and your business and your life to. And they're gonna be smart. They can't even arrest these guys, but they can tell us and arrest us for not wearing a mask. Oh, please. And this is Thomas Paine again, and I really like this right now after what we just saw. What signifies it to me? What does that mean? What does it mean to me? What difference does it make to me? Whether he who destroys my property and kills or threatens to kill me is a king or a common man, my countrymen or not my countrymen, whether it be done by an individual villain or an army of them. If we reason to the root of things, we shall find no difference. Neither can we any justice cause be assigned, neither can any just cause be
be a sign why we should punish in the one case and pardon in the other. Is Thomas Paine smart or what? He doesn't care if it's government or the king or a whole bunch of them. One person or an army of them. If they take my property or if a criminal takes my property, what difference does it make? They're both criminals. One's from the government, one's from the street. It doesn't matter to me which one does it. What matters to me is do I have anybody protecting me from it? Sheriff, and you're going to tell me that he's going to say he cannot protect you because his attorney advised him not to? Good Lord. Where in the world are we going? It is back to my case, Prince Mac case. It is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. That's right in that little book. Or do I, did I keep it? Although the states surrendered, that's wrong. Scalia got that wrong. We didn't surrender very many of our rights to the new federal government. In fact, very few. In fact, that was the whole purpose of the Constitution is that we would not be surrendering, surrendering many of our rights. Yes, we established a new federal government, but Patrick Henry never signed in off on any of it. You know why? Because he thought we were going to be surrendering too many of our rights. But that was never supposed to be. They violated the Constitution to do that, Patrick. If we would trust, if we had people we could trust in Washington, but we were never supposed to trust them. Even Jefferson said that. But bind them down by the chains of the Constitution, he warned. Although the states gave up a few powers. He, he fixes it though, just a minute, he fixes it. The states retained a residuary and inviolable sovereignty. And then look at now, he totally, this is where he starts, Scalia starts to take you through a mathematical, maybe political mathematical equation as to how we maintain liberty in America. Watch this. Residual state sovereignty was also implicit, of course, in the Constitution's conferral upon Congress of not all governmental powers. Well, if they don't have all of them, then what kind do they have? Well, he says it. But only discrete enumerated ones. Which, and then how do we keep it? Discrete, enumerated, and small. Limited is what he's saying here. How do we keep it that way? Well. Which implication is rendered express by somebody somewhere enforcing the Tenth Amendment? Who's supposed to enforce the Tenth Amendment? Congress? The federal government? So you're saying that they're in charge of enforcing state sovereignty? <laughs> no, the states are. Your sheriff is. Anybody else? Is? County commissioners, mayors, city councils. And then he quotes the Tenth Amendment. Because all powers not delegated to the federal government remain with the people or the states. That's the supreme law of the land, Sheriff. It's the supreme law of the land. And then he keeps this equation going. But it's still pretty simple as much as he does. The great innovation of this design was that our citizens would have two political capacities. One state and one federal. Get the next line. Get it. Each protected from incursion by the other. We're supposed to be protecting you from other governments. This isn't anything I made up. This is the, this is the law. Each protected from incursion by the other. So if the state is committing an incursion against you, against one of you leases, then you're supposed to stand and protect them and interpose and make sure they're not being victimized by the governor or the health department or any of the governor's henchmen. It's what the law demands and what you promised to do. As Madison expressed it, the local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. No more subject to the federal government than the federal government is subject to them. It shows how powerful we are. It shows the checks and balances. And your sheriff 
is just another check and balance on power. It doesn't matter who's trying to abuse their power or who's trying to abuse you. It does not matter who. It matters what. And, and it's almost like Thomas Paine said. What difference does it make if it's a street criminal, a highwayman, or one of my government? I'm still out. The mafia usually give you a fighting chance. Federal government, hardly ever. State government doesn't look like they're doing it either. Now he goes here again. He starts finishing his equation. Get, get this, and this again is in that little booklet. This separation of the two spheres, state and federal, but we could also put what? County and state. The separation of the two spheres of authority is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. It's just reinforcing the checks and balances therein. The entire Constitution is a system of what? Checks and balances. So that we don't what? Concentrate power in one location. So we avoid the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. Wow. Okay. Just as the separation and independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government serve to prevent the accumulation of excessive power in any one branch, a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government, or the states and the county government, will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. That is what we're after, no matter what level of government we work in. What we are after is a healthy balance of power. And anybody gets too crazy grabbing too much power to take care of us must be opposed, must be interposed. Okay? Is, is any of this too difficult to understand? I, I, think, I think we're even keeping up with you, aren't we? Yeah, 16, yeah, perfect, great, yeah. I'm gonna give you an A for today's effort, today. You're good. You homeschool or you at a public school? You homeschool? That's the best school there is. Right. And now he quotes the Federalist Papers. This is Federalist Paper 51. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. Isn't that what we're after? Any of you notice a double security for any of you leases? Have you seen that double security coming out to play? The sheriff ignores it, and somebody gets to run roughshod over your business, your life, and your and your freedom. And your sheriff kicks his feet up on his desk and goes, gosh, we're so busy with this drug war, wish we could help you, you know? And I don't want any of you to get the idea, just because I was once an undercover narcotics officer, that I support the drug war, because I don't. It's a farce, and it's another way to create a police state. And I'm not for it anymore. The power of the federal government would be augmented immeasurably if it were able to impress into its service and at no cost to itself the police officers of the 50 states. They can't do that. And neither can your government. How, now we're going to turn to Braveheart here, William Wallace. Uh, he's going to tell us why we don't take federal grants and that we don't even want the state messing with us financially either. But he's going to tell you what the danger is of taking those grants. The king desires peace. Long Shanks desires peace. He declares it to me, I swear it. He proposes that you withdraw your attack. In return, he grants you title, estates, and this is just a call which I am to pay to you personally. A lordship and titles. Gold. That I should become Judas. Peace is made in such ways. Slaves are made in such ways. That's it, every time. Because you start taking those federal grants and the sheriff starts taking those federal grants and you go, oh man. I have to fill all this stuff out and guarantee them that I'll do exactly what they say or I don't get the money. Good. Do not take that filthy money. They're bribes. They're not grants. That's right. The federal government we held may not compel the states to enact or administer a federal regulatory program. 
So this is starting to show again the checks and balances. But the, ooh, here it is. Right out of the Supreme Court case, two sheriffs sued the federal government. Folks, we sued the Clintons. Do you see the significance there? And I'm still here to tell you about it. Oh, my, other, my other quip against Bill. If you look at the history of Bill Clinton and all the lawsuits that were filed against that man, even back when he was governor of Arkansas, I'm the only one to sue him on a non-sexual matter. Yes. True. True story. Yeah. Folks, that paragraph right there alone does what? Tell your sheriff and tell your governor this is the Supreme Court of the United States that reinforces that you say we're all supposed to be going along with it. We ought to do what the Supreme Court says. Okay, do it. Specifically to stop overreach of government, what must we do? Make sure that we resist the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to your stupid crisis of the day. Oh, we have, oh, we have a pandemic, don't we, Josh? We have a pandemic. It's the pandemic. Don't shake your head at me. I'm not done yet. Okay? There's always one that does that. No. no. There's a pandemic, one of utter and complete corruption. That's the pandemic. 100%. Okay. All right, this is the order of the court. And we can start basically right there in gold. The federal government may ne neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions, counties and cities, to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. Now this is where it really gets down to something that really applies to you right here. And it's this. It matters not whether policy making is involved and no case by case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. You don't even need to add dual sovereignty. Fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system. You see that? We don't need to weigh the benefits or burdens or, or any of that with the laws. No case by case weighing of the burdens or benefits. You see folks, I don't have to weigh the burden or benefit of a face mask or face covering because you have no constitutional authority to do it in the first place. You have a little emergency or you have a big emergency. You can reason with us and you can teach us and you can persuade us to go along with you. You can do what Governor Nome has done, but you cannot force us and you cannot come up with new laws that were never endorsed or passed by a legislative branch. And you thinking you can do that, Governor, makes you a self-appointed dictator. And we don't have dictators in Minnesota because we don't have them in America. And you have gone so far off the fundamental beliefs of American principles that it makes us wonder where you're really from. China. <laughs> yep. Jupiter. So when you get to talking about gun control and they want to argue with you, does it make us safer? Does it reduce crime because you're not allowed? Oh, you crazy people aren't allowed to have guns. Your statistical analysis or weighing the burdens or benefits of any law is not the point. Is it lawful? Is it constitutional? And do, did you ever get the authority from we the people? If you didn't, you sure the heck can't enforce any of that. Don't you wish all the law enforcement agents in the state of Minnesota knew and understood that? You can't enforce it. We don't have to obey it. Just ask Martin Luther King, but ask George Washington too. And none of our enforcement agents should be enforcing it whatsoever. And this, is, this happened 
right when I was in uh, the district court case, the sheriffs who did this lawsuit only testified at the district court. And I was being cross-examined by the lawyer for the federal government, and all of a sudden she starts giving testimony to the judge, right in the middle of, of cross-examining me. And I'm going, what is she doing? Of course, I didn't say anything. I'm not allowed to say anything like that. So I thought my attorney would totally object to what she was doing. She's looking at me, and then she turns to the judge and starts testifying. I'm going, what? She doesn't get to testify. She can't take the stand. She can't do any of this. So I'm looking at my attorney and going, you know, as much as I can without making a spectacle. And he's looking at me, and he's looking at me with a real nice grin on his face, you know, like, I got this. And the judge stops him. And he says, Counselor, do not pretend in this courtroom that your statistical analysis somehow equates to constitutionality. <laughs> you see, lowering the curve, does that change anything? Does that make it constitutional? If the, if the law works and we stop every COVID-19 case in America, does that make it constitutional? No. Doesn't matter. You never had the authority to do it. There's going to be another crisis of the day next year. And what are they teaching us all? We're here to take care of you and prevent you from having any harm whatsoever of any crisis or emergency in our country, and they'll be coming every other year. So just be ready. Because you're just too stupid to take care of yourself. You need people like us that really know what's up to take care of you. Oh my God. Okay. It is incumbent, now get this, this happened right next door in Michigan. It is incumbent, well, almost next door. It is incumbent on the courts to ensure decisions are made according to the rule of law, not hysteria. Tell your governor. One hopes that this great principle essential to any free society, including ours, will not itself yet become another casualty of COVID-10. Sorry, it was supposed to be 19. Maybe it's I don't know. Typo, I didn't catch. Of coronavirus. Michigan State Supreme Court 7-0 on the 77-year-old barber, Carl Mabry. We've been winning in court. Did Whitmer care? Nope, she went right over. Dun, dun, dun.
I want her to wrestle. Why won't you stand there? Why do you want to push us around? Will you listen to that? The law's the law. The law's the law. Why did you want to rest? The law's the law. You know how many sheriffs are saying that? I'm not going to stand for liberty. I'm not going to stand for America. I'm not going to stand for my people. I'm not going to keep my oath. The law is the law. The Constitution is not the law. But some mandate from a governor is. You know what the supremacy clause says? It says the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Mm -hmm. It's the supreme law of the land. You know what the Bill of Rights was? Take that up to the 10th power that these are the supreme laws of the land. Do you know what one is supreme above all of that? That this nation conceived in liberty was dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And when the Declaration of Independence said that, we meant it. We haven't always lived by it. And I'm ashamed of that. This happened when I was three years old. And this shouldn't have happened. But what should have the two peace officers done when they got on that bus? Well, I'm going to tell you how it should have played out. Okay? I need a Rosa Parks. Come here. You're Rosa Parks. It won't hurt. You don't have to do anything, honestly. Okay. All right, you're right there. She was about twice your age, though, okay? But, you okay now? You're not too nervous? All right, thanks for coming. All right. This is how it should have been played out that day. The sheriff was in dispatch when the call came out, okay? He hears it, and he says, dispatch, I'll take that call myself. I'll take Officer Smith with me. So they go there to the scene, and the sheriff doesn't really know what he's going to do when he's there. He's just going to go handle the call. So he walks up with Deputy Smith. Did I say Smith or Jones? No, 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 no. Okay, so Deputy Smith is with him. They walk up to Rosa Parks, and they said, the sheriff goes, just what seems to be the problem here? And, of course, she says, why can't we all just be left alone? Anybody else think that? Lisa, did that ever cross your mind? You want to be left alone? All you other Lisas, you want to just be left alone? Yes. Boy, wouldn't that be something? And that really touches the sheriff. And he sits down next to her. And he says, Mrs. Park, what you did here tonight took a lot of courage. We really admire you. I'd like to shake your hand. Thanks for standing. I know that must have taken a lot of courage. And it would be an honor for my deputy and me to escort you home safely. Would you allow us to do that? And she's a little suspicious of that, isn't she? She doesn't know who these guys are at night. She doesn't know that they're one of the hooded knights. And so she's a little bit reluctant, but I'm making this up anyway, so I wish it was, I wish we had never heard of Rosa Parks. I wish we would have heard of the two de deputies or two officers that took her home safely that night. That's what we should have heard of. They would have been true heroes instead of her being a hero. And she's one of my all time favorite heroes because what did she do? The same thing that Lisa and Lisa did stand against stupid laws. And the sheriff should have been the one to show people what we do with stupid laws. And Edmund Burke said, the essence of tyranny is the enforcement of stupid laws. And where should sheriffs put stupid laws? But in the trash can. The night that she was arrested, that's what the sheriff should have done. And then they start escorting her home because they ask where it is. And he goes, it's in a well-lit area. There's lots of, there's a lot of traffic there. And he said, in fact, there's an all-white restaurant there that sells really good hamburgers. I've had them there. And he says, would you like to stop by there and get some hamburgers for your family tonight? I bet your husband didn't fix dinner. And so she says, yeah, that'd be nice. Let's go. 
So he takes her in there and tells the people, take her order and fulfill it right away. And they did. And he's teaching the community what we do with those stupid laws. And then they come outside and guess what they see? An all white water fountain. And he said, Mrs. Parks, you might as well make it three for three. You didn't sit at the back of the bus. You came into the white restaurant, have a drink. And she does. And then these two peace officers take her home. And her husband comes out seeing what's up. No, what happened, what happened? He starts yelling and said, Mr. Parks, everything's fine. Rosa didn't give her seat to a white man tonight. I told you not to do that stuff anymore. He did it before. <laughs> and he said, Mr. Parks, the sheriff said, it's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna take care of this, but we gotta start somewhere. And Rosa started it tonight. But let me ask you, Mr. Parks, you have a gun in the home? And he goes, well, yeah, I do, 12 gauge. Do you keep it loaded? Well, Sheriff, it doesn't do you any good if it's not. <laughs> Very true. But the principle here is you have the right to protect you and your family. Right. So keep that handy. And we're going to be giving you extra patrol for the next few days and maybe the coming weeks to make sure nobody bothers you about this once the word gets out what Rosa did. But we're going to change this cultural norm and we're going to change this policy and you know there was no law against not giving your seat to a white man you know what she was charged with disorderly conduct which i'm surprised you haven't got that too one of you crazy lisas that break the law yeah. okay Two uh, law-breaking leases. Lisa number one, Lisa number two. Come on, come here. Today, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're a Lisa. She's a Lisa. Sounds like a song. Mona, Mona Lisa. She's already crying. I haven't even begun yet. Okay, let's examine this. You're trying to keep your business open? They're going after you, right? Okay. Should they be going after her? No, no. of course not. Okay. Tell me the difference between Rosa Parks and these two patriotic Americans that just want to feed their families and keep their business. Doesn't matter what they're doing with it. They have a right to keep their business open. And who's supposed to defend that? Every employee in the city, county, and state is supposed to be defending that. Shall we look at the Declaration of Independence real quick and ask, what is government for? That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Sheriff, you have one assignment here, and that is to protect the rights of the citizens that live in your county. And that means all the leases. And it means anyone who has been abused by any other government, you have a duty to interpose. And Sheriff, don't get all hot and bothered about it. Like I said, most of the time, it only takes a phone call. But it would really be neat if the next time they go there to serve her anything, or her, that you stand there and you say, take those papers back to wherever you got them and don't come back here again. And you leave it at that. And if they come back, then you stand there again. And you make sure you have his number and you make sure you have his number and you call him. And right now we got to get these guys, that are their sheriffs, a little bit educated. And we, let's do it. Rosa stood against stupid law. They're standing against stupid law. They're standing, Rosa stood for her God-given rights. They're standing for their God-given rights. That is supposed to be what in America? That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And we interpose and we tell these people, especially health department people, they have no authority whatsoever, okay? 
stupid bureaucracy, okay? They have no law enforcement authority. So I just, I wanna thank you for what you've done. We're so sorry that this has happened to you. Yeah. And it's our duty to also stand with that. So why you have so many doing this, I don't know. Do. Maybe, we need to, maybe we need to change the name. We have so many roses here. Because that's what this all is all about. And you could start this whole conversation with your sheriff. If you were called back into time to December 1st, 1955, Montgomery, Alabama, on the bus about seven o'clock right downtown. Sheriff, would your county attorney or your association attorney advise you to arrest Rosa Parks? Or do you think that somewhere in there we're sensitive enough to the principles of liberty that you would go there and actually protect her? Then why aren't we doing it today? For God's sakes, do we have anybody sensitive enough to know when we've gone too far? Look into her face and tell me we haven't gone too far. This nightmare that these two wonderful ladies have been put through in the United States of America. No, nope. can't believe it. And then the sheriff is gonna say, he can't protect them? No. I will never accept that. One, it's not true. He has the duty and responsibility to do it. He promised. Badge versus the bad. Sometimes it comes down to that. And in the 2003 Range Magazine, it gave three examples of sheriffs that did it. And these were against the Goliath federal government. Sheriff Gary Amon in Owe County, Idaho, didn't want BLM, that's Bureau of Land Management, <laughs> didn't want BLM help the local law enforcement. <laughs> And they did it in California, San Bernardino, like the largest county in all of California. In the 20,000 square miles of this county, he revoked the law enforcement authority of BLM, BLM agents. And then Ken Jones in Eureka County, uh, Nevada said, what they really want is to extend federal authority over all law enforcement in the United States, whether local people agree with it or not. Well, it's not in this county. That's what we should be saying for her and her and everybody else. <laughs> Not in this county. Okay, so this is the example of sheriffs just the last few years, maybe the last few months, who have. Oh, sorry. There we go. Sheriffs all across the country who've been standing for freedom. Were they wrong? Sheriff Palmer stood against BLM. He even challenged their authority. He wrote them a letter and said, tell me where you get your authority to enforce laws in my county. Guess what they never did? Never, never responded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These are great, great examples of sheriffs standing for freedom. It goes on and on and on. Sheriff Mark Lamb, Sheriff Schuster in Arizona, Sheriff Pamela Elliott in Texas, Nevada sheriffs right now against their governor. Idaho sheriffs stand for the Constitution against their governor. Nick Finch released a guy charged with uh, possession of an illegal gun. Back that. Sheriff Joe Arpaio, need I say more? Sheriff David Clark, Sheriff Grady Judge, Sheriff Garley, Maine Sheriff Nichols, Sheriff Susan Bradyville, that's us, that's Long Island Bill, Sheriff Dave Mattis against the IRS in Bighorn County, Wyoming. Sheriffs in Colorado, Sheriff Christopher in Delaware, Sheriff Mueller in Oregon. Oh my goodness, it just goes on and on. Badge versus the badge. When we have lived under a pernicious tower long enough, no matter how oppressive, we grow so accustomed to the yoke that its removal seems frightening, even wrong. 
That's the political correctness of the day. Yep. You try to stand for freedom today, and what does the mainstream, lamestream media do? Oh, you're a radical. Oh, you're a danger. You're going to commit violence. Let me tell you a little bit about that one. The Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, Ooh. several years ago, about five or six, I don't know, put me in one of their periodicals with 40 people in this country that were considered domestic terrorists. I'm on the list. I spent 20 years in law enforcement. I never shot anybody. I never beat anybody up. I never nightsticked anybody. I never maced anybody. Never committed an act of violence towards another human being. In 20 years, yes, I was on patrol, even undercover, detective, whatever I was. Never committed an act of violence, but now I'm a domestic terrorist. And I've never advocated violence of any kind. And yet, I made the list. But so did Judge Napolitano. So did Ron Paul. And so did a few other sheriffs. And it's astonishing what the mainstream media tries to do to people who stand for liberty today. We're a danger, but government isn't that shuts people down, that destroys the lives of people, arrests people for not wearing a mask. But they honor Rosa Parks. <laughs> do they, do, have they ever said why they honor Rosa Parks? Never. Because they, they would be talking about themselves, people who pass stupid laws. We stood against stupid laws. What did Harriet Tubman do? She violated the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. Why was she a hero? Because she violated the Fugitive Slave Act. And now we're going to put her on a $20 bill. I'm all for that. Because it's replacing some racist guy that believed in the Trail of Tears and was extremely racist against Native Americans. And yes, I judge him harshly for that. I'd just soon have Harriet there. And now I can tell everybody why she was such a hero. She broke the law. <laughs> she defied the law. <laughs> when asked him if he considered himself a constitutional sheriff, San Juan, Utah County Sheriff, Rick Eldridge replied, I do. I thought every sheriff was supposed to be a constitutional sheriff. That's our job. Yeah, maybe you can use some of that. Reverend, with your permission, I'd like to make an announcement. Young man, this is a house of God. I understand that, Reverend. I apologize. The South Carolina militia is being called up. I'm here to enlist every man willing. Son, we are here to pray for the souls of those men hanging outside. Yes, pray for them. But honor them by taking up arms with us. And bring more suffering to this town. King George can hang those men, our friends. He can hang any one of us. Dead Scott, barely a week ago, I heard you read for two hours about independence. Uh -huh. Mr. Hardwick, how many times have I heard you speak of freedom at my father's table? Half the men in this church, including you, Father, and you, Reverend, are as ardent patriots as I. Will you now, when you are needed most, stop at only words? Is that the sort of men you are? of which you have so strongly spoken and in which you so strongly believe. Who's with us?
Man, you take a stand, didn't it? And even though he was on the front page, <laughs> you're standing. <huh? laughs> I've had that happen a few times, but we did this at one of our conferences, and the sheriff just started standing, and it was, it was beautiful. You didn't need to stand, man, but we're going to need to. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you get arrested, okay, uh, remember, we're going to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Woo! I will be happy to come back and testify for you in court. As an expert witness, they're going to try to do everything to keep me off the stand, but that's okay. We're going to keep fighting. Just, just have me up there. We're going to keep fighting for you and the other Lisa uh, and all you other Rosa Parks, but we will. And then maybe if we need other people to do it or we find out, and I'll go and talk to your sheriff and find out why he allowed such a, an injustice to take place. And, and I will cancel any other event to come and do that except one. So I hope we can postpone it around this. We're having a conference in Houston, right outside Houston in Montgomery County, Texas, on February 26th and 27th. That's one you need to give your sheriff to. And if you have to pay their way, do it, whatever, you can do it through us so we can say, hey, we've got a scholarship for you, just come and do it. Just get there, you're gonna see the truth. You're gonna hear from judges and other sheriffs all across America, and they're gonna see this, what you've just witnessed today. Any of you want your sheriffs to see this training? Yes. 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 Just a few, huh? yeah. so, This is Dick Carver. He's from Nye County, Nevada. He died about 10 years ago from a brain tumor. He was a very dear friend of mine. We traveled the country. I was telling my story about my lawsuit, and he was telling his story about this. Front page, Time Magazine, and most of those are family members standing behind him. In fact, his wife, Midge, she took his place as county commissioner when he passed away. And what a wonderful lady. But they had a road washout in Nye County. It was a mountain road, it was a dirt road. And his business normally is, he works heavy equipment. So he told them that he would go fix the, the did I say bridge or road? Okay, road. He had a road washout. He was gonna take his bulldozer up there and fix it. Well. The Forest Service said, you can't touch this federal property. It says it's in Nye County. And so finally, they wouldn't let him fix it. And the ranchers and other people and hunters that went up there said, man, we can't get around that road. And so finally, the Board of Supervisors, the county commissioners voted unanimously just to let him go fix the, the, the road. So there's about 150 people went up there, a few deputies, and I think two or three federal agents that tried to stand in the way of a bulldozer. <laughs> they must have missed that training, okay? So he gets up there and starts going. They stand in the way and tell him, you're gonna get arrested if you don't get off of that thing and go put it up, blah, blah, blah. So he stops it, gets off, and he goes, ignores them, and went to the deputies and said, officers, if they get in the way again, arrest them because you'll be saving their lives because I'm gonna run over them if they get in the way again. I'm not stopping. So he gets back up on there, and I guess they believed him, they got out of the way, and he fixed the road. And they were threatening him with arrest and fines and all this other stuff. They never paid a dime in fine, nobody went to jail, and they did what they came to do, they fixed the road. Government always gets in the way. They don't know how to leave people alone. They always gotta try to justify their existence somehow. Yep. yep. By stopping what? Justice. By being fair and honest. Fair and honest. Boy, wouldn't that be something for government to try that for a while? And so Dick Carver was an American hero. And a lot of people, I'm, I'm proud to say that I was his friend and that he did this. Should have been the sheriff getting in the way, but you know, he had the sheriff's permission. He had the deputies there to defend him and they got the job done. And every time that we've had sheriffs or county commissioners or others interpose. We win every time. And I'm not making that up. All those sheriffs that we had rolling through there, they all won in one way or another. And there's more now. This is kind of funny. Because I'm going to show you a principle from the north 
and I'm going to show you a principle from the south. This is a different kind of bomb. If you look back through history, you will see men fighting for pain, or women, or some other kind of blue. Fight for land, power. Because a king leads them, or, or just because they like killing them. We are here for something new. This has not happened much in the history of the world. We are an army out to set other men free. Maybe we're not an army. Because I said that once, and see, Sheriff Max trying to raise an army. Okay, we are a group of sheriffs trying to set other men free. Government derives its power from the consent of the people. Ever go. Ever. Well, let me make this very plain to you, sir. We do not consent. And we will never consent. And what you've got to do is you've got to go back over there to your parliament and you've got to make it very plain to them. You've got to tell them that what we're fighting for is a, is a freedom from what we consider to be the rule of a foreign power. I mean, that's all we want. That's what this war is all about. Jim, no, 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 no. Now, now we, we established this country in the first place with very strong state governments just for that very reason. I mean, let me put it to you this way. My home is in Virginia. The government of my home is home. Virginia would not allow itself to be ruled by, by some uh, king over there in London, and it's not about to let itself be ruled by some president in Washington. Virginia, by God, sir, is going to be run by Virginia. Now, where I believe in that principle, you already know me well enough to know. I would never support slavery of any kind, just like we've been talking about tonight. But Minnesota should be run by Minnesotans. And if we have a problem with the governor, we should be able to take care of it without violence. But he should get the picture and he should get the message. And we should take back America, county by county, one sheriff at a time. And if we're not standing with him, and if we haven't increased his level of knowledge and given him the right type of education, then it's our fault. If we give him a chance to learn and to humble himself and to understand the principles of liberty, then, if he doesn't do it, we try to find other remedies. Recall him, get your petitions going, whatever you have to do, but don't grab your pitchforks. Who knows if that there will be a time for that. But we've got lots of peaceful remedies still. Not lots, sorry. We've got a few peaceful remedies still. And we have an obligation as Americans and Christians to exhaust all of them first. And in the end, we're doing this. We're fighting for each other. And it doesn't matter what color we are. And it doesn't matter what religion we are. I think that we probably have, what, 10, 15 different religions in here? As far as I'm concerned, you're all my brothers and sisters. And if we're not fighting for each other, then we're going to do what Ben Franklin said. If we don't hang together, we will hang we're going to hang separately. So. Hmm. One other one real quick. Mayor Bryce Hamlin of Eager, Arizona. What authority does the town of Eager or any other state or local government have to infringe on the rights of healthy, law-abiding citizens? My response from the onset of COVID-19 pandemic has been that if we err, we will err on the side of freedom. Okay. And finally, we'll finish with Washington. Well, you know, every time you see a picture of him crossing the Delaware, he looks so strong and magnificent and so confident. Do you know how many times he almost turned around and went back? Yes, he prayed to God Almighty before they did this because he knew if they didn't win Trenton, the Revolutionary War is over and all the founding fathers would have been tortured and killed, including him. And so this is when he called Thomas Paine's work in and all the men read 
the American crisis. And this was something. Because, like we said earlier, you couldn't have seen a more pathetic army in your life. One captain wrote in his journal that some of the men were naked in every sense of the word. Why? They didn't have any boots. Their boots had worn through. And they didn't have any boots. They didn't have a coat. And Martha Washington and some of the other wives were following him around trying to sew clothes for him as much as they possibly could. Back then, how long would that take? So, yeah, it didn't work out very well. And so some of the men had taken the last vestiges of their shirts and tied them around their feet because this was Christmas time. In fact, it was Christmas Day when Washington said, tonight we cross back across the Delaware, land over near Trenton, where it's 15 miles in the snow and ice to get to Trenton. And yes, we're going to take on the Hessians, and we're going to beat them. We'll have surprise on our side. And he actually got the man to stop deserting, to stop thinking about how they were sick and starving and exhausted, and how they didn't have boots, how you ignore that and not think about that, I'll never know. And another captain wrote in his journal, there were blood prints in the snow. A couple of men died of hypothermia on the way. But nevertheless, the blood prints in the snow showed their path. 15 miles into Trenton, took the Hessians by surprise, Killed about 25 to 30 and took the rest captive. They took 900 captive. But it was the best Christmas they ever had. Because now they had all their venison and, and turkey and food from the day before celebrating Christmas. And they, they probably participated a little wrong here too. But they took their boots and they took their coats and they took their guns and their ammo and their, and their gunpowder. And it was the best Christmas Washington ever had. And some of the men realized and looked at him and his white horse and realized that this was a true leader. And so what did Washington teach us from the Battle of Trenton? What's the real lesson there? When you're exhausted, when you're so tired you can't move and you're so sick you cannot move, and you're starving, and you have no resources, and you feel like the country has abandoned you and not helped. What time is it? Ask General Washington. What time is it, sir? It's time to get up and fight. My dear friends, that is what we will do for Lisa. In a very real sense, we will stand next to her. We will interpose. We will do all we can to make sure that happens. Now I'm asking each of you for a favor too. We need help at the CSPOA. I ask each of you to become a member. I ask each of you to donate. And if you can give $10,000, give seven of it to her. And then, wait, oh, what, forgot about her. No, give four of it to her, four of it to her, and two of it to the CSPOA, because we're going to keep this going, and that conference we're having is costing us a lot of money. And I'm asking you to do what you can. I'm asking you to stand with us. Join us in this holy cause. The organization isn't the important thing. It's the work we're doing, and I've been doing this for 25 years. I started this organization in 2011. And I could sit here and count the miracles one after one after one to you. And I should have never been sheriff. That was a miracle. I should have never filed that lawsuit. That was a miracle. And we should have never gone to the Supreme Court. That was a miracle. Do you know what the chance of going to the Supreme Court is? 1%. They take 1% of the cases across their desk. And then to win after that? Folks, this has just been one miracle after another, and we need more, and we need you with us. I ask that you join us in this holy cause. 
support each other, help each other, and let's do as General Washington taught us. It's time to stand. It's time. I hate to even I mention the word fight. It is a fight. It is a battle. It's a battle of good and evil. The same one that's been going on for all time. Let's do it together. Let's stand beside those who need us. Cry with those who cry and stand with those who stand. It's been such a pleasure to be with you tonight. Look in your faces. It gives me such strength. Thank you so much for having me. I apologize if I went too long, but this is exactly what we'll be showing the sheriffs on uh, February 26 and 27 in Montgomery County, Texas. Sheriff Rand Henderson is co-hosting that with us, and we hope that you can get some of your sheriffs there. We're concentrating on Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, that area. But if we can get anybody else there, we will take it. We don't care how late it is. I will guarantee you a seat if I have to move one up on the stand. So let's get after it. It's time to stand, and it's time to fight, and it's time to take America back, county by county, one sheriff at a time. Never think he should do that by himself. Will not help. God bless.